Facebook Live family and friends, we're back! New location, what's up? We did it. Thank you all for your patience and understanding that yes, technical difficulties do occur sometimes. Uh, it's not gonna happen this time. I'm crossing my fingers. If it does, we are cursed. I tell you, cursed. Just blame me and my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just pick up right where we were, Tommy, if you could, and uh, talk to us about this idea of dissociative states in trauma. Yeah, well, we were just basically talking about how uh, trauma can cause dissociative states because when we're going through a really, really hard time, say physical abuse, sexual abuse, something along those lines, our brain recognizes that we're experiencing something too overwhelming, too painful, too much to mm -hmm. handle in that given state. So the brain makes this decision sometimes and it kind of cuts out of our body and allows our body to take that punishment and kind of retreats into this dissociative state where we don't quite experience it as much of a real thing as it is if, if we were kind of fully present in our body. Totally. So while that first develops as a coping skill as a result to deal with trauma, the brain then learns that that's something it can do and in any high state stress mm. time period, it can just cut into that. So even though at the time of trauma, it can be a very protective thing to go into this dissociative state later on in life, say if we're, um, you know, in a stressful situation at work or something along these lines, mm -hmm. or, you know, in an argument in a relationship or something, yeah. if we then begin to dissociate, it becomes tr tr trouble for us, you know, it causes a lot of problems because we're not fully in the moment. We can't right. think clearly, can't relate clearly, that sort of thing. Um, so, there, there was really quick, sorry, there yeah. was a question out there when we, when we cut out before, sure. uh, one of our viewers out there was asking about this idea of control. Oh, yeah. uh, and I don't know what he was referring to because we cut out, but if you could talk about control, I guess, in the sense of altered state or, or something you might have touched on, <laughs> that'd be great because that was a good question and we didn't get to answer it, if you, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, control is an interesting topic, right? I think the comment, if I remember correctly, it was like, what really is control, sure. right? And I think the implication there is, is that we are a lot less in control than we actually feel like we are, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10. So what is control? Um, no, I mean, this is one of those things that philosophers could argue about for, for years, right? For me and my understanding of control, I'd say it's largely an illusion. Sure. Um, the metaphor I typically think about when I think about control is uh, kind of like being on, a, on an ocean and we've got this small sailboat that we're in. And, you know, we can't control the waves. We can't control the wind. We can't control the storms that may brew. Um, and this is the same true for life, right? We can't control necessarily what happens in life. Life is going to throw random curveballs at us, throw mm -hmm. us some storms. We can't control these things. Now, we do have some measure of control in the sense of, at least in this metaphor, we've got the sail or maybe if we've got like an yeah. engine on the back of the boat, we We've got that right. right so we can somewhat guide it but we're still being pushed around by the you know the winds of fate so to speak mm -hmm. so how much control do we really have you know we might have some measure of control over our behaviors some measure of control over kind of how we think and perceive things um, but then largely <laughs> life does what it wants right and so to pretend that we've got control in my opinion is largely an, an illusion now, we've got more control than we might think, though. You know, we're not completely yeah. lost in the storm. It's reminded me of like a CBT model or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, all right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, so from the CBT model, we do have a lot more control than we might think. Right. So the CBT model says that we can actually gain control over, um, over our life because the model essentially says this. You know, we have these thinking patterns, right. and the thinking patterns may or may not be in our control. The thinking patterns affect our emotions, how we feel about something, because how we perceive something is going to be playable large difference in how we uh, interpret it. So for right. instance, like if I see somebody and it looks like they're looking at me, right? Mm -hmm. I might have the thought of, oh, that person's checking me out, right? <laughs> or I might have the thought yeah. of like, that person's like giving me like the, the scary evil eye, right. you know, and I might get paranoid mm -hmm. and like, what's that shifty guy up to? Right. Um, and how I perceive that is going to have a, a big impact on how I feel about myself for the rest of the mm -hmm. day. So if I think somebody was checking me out, it might be, you know, confidence boost. I might yeah. be feeling better about myself. Totally. If, however, the perception is, you know, this person was um, judging me or maybe making fun of me in their head or something like that, mm -hmm. it might leave me feeling really discouraged. Totally. So from the CBT model, there is some measure of control in terms of our perspective, right? Like what, um, how we're going to perceive, how we're going to think about the experiences that we have. Now, from the ACT model, which is another school of thought in terms of therapy, they say we have a lot less control over what that is than the we act? might think. What is the ACT? 
theory. So the act model essentially says that we can't control where the mind goes, that the mind's essentially like this evil little right. gremlin on the uh -huh. back of our shoulders, whispering and saying little things into our ears. Acceptance commitment therapy, right? Right. Acceptance yeah. commitment okay. therapy. Cool. So in an acceptance commitment therapy, they say that the mind is largely uncontrollable or where it goes, but mm. we do have some measure of control over what we do when it goes to these places. Got it. So yep. the classic metaphor is like that the mind is like a dark room filled with clutter, but we get this flashlight mm -hmm. and where we shine that flashlight. The trick is that where we shine that flashlight seems to fill up the room. So if we're, for instance, you know, we're only, uh, you know, if we're thinking about all of our failures in life or if we're, you know, if we uh, fail the test, even though some, you know, everything else in life is going really well, if we had this one little failure and that's all we're focusing on, it seems to consume us. It seems like our lives are failure and we're, right. we're filtering out all the things that are going on or going well in life. So, you know, the brain might go spontaneously and think about, you know, us being failures or, mm -hmm. you know, the negative stuff in life, just like the flash light might randomly shine wherever it shines but then we do have some control after it shines wherever it shines on whether we linger there whether we stay focused on that thought or whether we shift our perspective and say instead think about things that are more positive or things that are happening presently in the moment mm -hmm. you know grounding ourselves in kind of a mindfulness mentality of, of being present in the moment so there is some measure of control over where we place our perspective and how we go about thinking about things yeah but you know, how much control does that really grant us is an open question. So subjective. Right. But I, I'm so glad that you brought this idea. Thank you for the question out there um, of what control is, what it feels like, how it, how using different models of therapeutic modalities, you can change that, fix it, you know, not fix it, but help guide yourself in that way. I think it's really helpful in, in providing us and our viewers out there the actual information because it really makes it, in my eyes, and thumbs up out there if you feel this way, that it makes it more explainable in a way that I could go maybe commit to something like hmm. that. Yeah, sure. You know, or, or find myself being in a place where I'm like, I'm ready for this mental health, you know, check in because the way that Tommy just described it makes, makes it's me. Right. Well, and that's the thing, you know, so many people who are struggling with mental health symptoms feel largely out of control of what right. they're going through, feel out of control of their lives. And so having at least some glimpse that it's possible to um, control the sail in the storm, you know, at least have some influence on where we're going is for you know for some people that's the light at the end of the tunnel that they need yeah. to keep going forward so you know the idea of, uh, of there being some element of control of life is really important the, the the paradox here is that if we take that too far if we try to control life too much totally it's a lot like gripping water too tightly mm -hmm. you know it's going to just slip through our fingers so you know it's it's a bit of a paradoxical thing totally. we can't sometimes letting go of control helps us gain control as well mm -hmm. it's one of those yeah. weird things in life so. weird super weird but i mean I, the way that you've been using metaphors throughout this whole conversation i think really can resonate with people out there potential clients that both of us may have sure so seriously if you're listening and you're watching take all this to to heart because i think it's it's really in my eyes super helpful and, and I'd be grateful for this information hmm. if I was in that space. So thank you. Yeah. Always. Appreciate course, that. Yeah. Um, Tommy, I want to talk about this painting, man, because oh, yeah. as we're talking about altered states, <laughs> literally I'm looking at it. I'm like, fuck, well, is that my altered state? So I don't know who this artist is or, or, or how you resonate with it or how you sure. connect with it, but I literally feel as if, that is an altered state. So talk about that, please. Yeah. So actually, both these paintings, this painting, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> this painting right here, and then uh, this, <laughs> nope, wrong one, that painting. Right um, who, where, why, who? <laughs> so both those paintings are made by the same artist. Sure. He's a, um, a guy named J.R. Slatham. He's based in Portland, Oregon. And mm -hmm. I actually met the guy when, um, when I was visiting Portland, visiting a friend. Uh, they have kind of these open markets, much like uh, farmer's markets, that Sick. kind of thing. And so there was this artist and, uh, you know, I saw his work and I loved his work. So I, I you know, bought a couple paintings and then I talked with him a little bit. And as it turns out, he's a self-proclaimed psychonaut. And a psychonaut is somebody who explores consciousness or particularly mm. explores altered states of consciousness. So what this guy does is he goes into these, um, these trance states um, and he does it with a wide variety of different tools, uh, tools that I'm talking about here. 
And then in these states, he receives creative inspiration. He kind of uh, is able to tap into a different frame of thinking that helps him become more inspired, more creative, That's and, and just original. And then yeah. he comes out of these states and then, you know, paints what we see here. So this is, yeah, it's a reflection of uh, totally. an altered state. Absolutely. And do you, I don't know what your take is on this, but being in Colorado, we know that so, so Island is now legal and sure. other psychedelics or have you. Is this a, a, an artist you think would take that medication, <laughs> we'll say, and then go and face an altered state and i don't know if you've had experience with with whoever out there or what yourself in, in that regard if you talk about it, that'd be really cool oh sure psilocybin yeah um you know i can't say whether or not jr sladham has experienced a psilocybin trip or uh, i mean for, for those who uh <laughs> it kind of looks like it. Um, for those who don't know psilocybin is what's commonly referred to and out there as magic mushrooms you know i'm uh, just psychedelic mushrooms. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, I can't say whether or certain uh, J.R. Sladen was using psilocybin, sure. but psilocybin has been one of the most commonly used tools to access altered states of consciousness. Yes. Talk on that, please. So yes. um, there's a whole field on this that's been around for, you know, thousands of years. So the old spiritual idea of shamanism. And yes. Shamanism is, is this word that's largely misunderstood in our Absolutely. culture today. Um, shamanism originally started in, uh, there was a particular indigenous spiritual practice in, uh, if I remember correctly, in Siberia, in oh, wow. Russia, where these indigenous people in Siberia were using, uh, if I remember correctly, the Amanita muscaria mushroom um, to induce these altered states. Uh, so okay. they would harvest these mushrooms because they saw reindeer eating them, and then reindeer would start prancing and jumping about <laughs> in very odd ways. Right? That's amazing. And oh, so my God, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just, you know, having a, having a blast. Out there. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, these, these indigenous people saw this and mm -hmm. then saw that the mushrooms that they were eating and began using these mushrooms uh, and trying to experiment with the effects of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, the tradition of shamanism became essentially the art of how to use altered states of consciousness to navigate um, what they believed was navigating the spirit world, you yes. know, coming into contact with spirits and mm -hmm. using the information that spirits provided to help the community. Oftentimes yeah. these ended up being medicine men who would then communicate with spirits to offer advice or cure ailments yeah. or whatever the case may be. Totally. Um, these individuals became highly prized in their culture because they had this access to this special knowledge, which really helped, uh, you know, uh, help the development, especially the spiritual development of the community but with a cost. It was always hmm. said in the, the, these shamanic cultures that the, the shaman, the individual who is using these altered states, um, it was said that there was a bit of a cost on them, almost hmm. as if entering the spirit world um, had a weight to it that accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's pretty common that ancient you know, shamans would well, there's an old saying that there's there's either old shamans or bold shamans, but <laughs> not either, not sure. both at the same time. So there was people who experimented greatly and, you know, really pushed themselves to the edge, um, but they didn't always survive for the long time. <laughs> sure. so, um, so anyway, shamanism uh, today refers to any indigenous culture that's using plants or using psychedelics as a method of exploring these altered states of consciousness. Right. Now, so you're alluding to the fact that this can be a very medicinal experience. Experience. Yes. Um, so you know, psilocybin has you know a bit of a um, bit of a schizophrenic understanding in our culture. There are certain individuals who approach mushrooms from a very recreational or almost a mm -hmm. party-based standpoint. You know, sure. they use it when they're going to clubs, having fun, um, or even just you know going through a hike or something along those lines. Yeah. And then there's another way to use mushrooms, which is trying to use them intentionally to focus on things or expose yourself to things that's hard to expose yourself to in normal wakeful states. Mm. So for instance, um, for those of you who are familiar with Carl Jung's work, uh, he's a psychologist who yep. um, was a student of Sigmund Freud. He talked a lot about what he called the shadow, which are these, um, these repressed aspects of the self, things about yourself that you don't necessarily want to look at, maybe painful memories, maybe, yep. maybe things we're ashamed of, or maybe just really dark, um, hard to cope with aspects of human life, you know, like, um, for instance, the fact that we're all going to die, you right. know, big one. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of ding, a big ding, one. Ding, that we all <laughs> Take that home with you. We'll talk about that another time. Don't you worry.
but primarily we're, we're, we're talking about kind of the things in life that keep us awake at night. You know, the kind mm. of stuff is as you're falling asleep, the stuff bubbles to the surface and bothers you. Got you know, it. It's that thing you said in the third grade to that kid and it really hurt his feelings mm -hmm. and it's been bothering you ever since. And you've been, why did I say that? Right, you know, what does right, that right. say about me as a person? Totally. So these are some of the material, the content that's found in our shadow or the kind of the repressed aspect of our nature. Mm -hmm. And typically we don't want to look at this stuff. It brings up a lot of shame, a lot of anxiety, but say in a psilocybin, trip all this stuff bubbles up to the surface and yeah. you're forced to look at it but but it feels more accessible it feels more open you feel more free to explore this content you don't have that weight of shame or guilt that's bearing you down and making you want to turn away and not right look at right it. you're leaning into it right is what you've described exactly. to me you know it's like this idea of leaning into something and being okay with feeling the feelings that you're feeling and then getting through that in a way that feels therapeutic to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Going back to our conversation around control, right. you know, this is essentially the element of surrendering control, leaning into yeah. something and yes. letting it take you, letting it, you know, giving the power to the experience itself right. rather than you feeling like you've got the control yeah. or power. That's like a really scary thing for a lot of people. Letting but go I, of control. Right. But I feel <laughs> like if you can experience this idea of alter state using whatever modality you may use, like to, the idea of to let go of that and just go within the experience, I think yeah. so powerful, so powerful. That's one of the things that psilocybin really helps teach is right. you will have this experience when you're under the influence of psilocybin where you want it to stop. You know? Right, of course. You, you want to be Scary. experience that sober mind state. You feel mm -hmm. like you're on a trip that's going down a direction you don't want to go in. And you'll have this feeling of just, no, you know, I don't want to go through this. I'm going to will myself into a sober state right. of consciousness. And the funny thing is, is the more you struggle, yeah. the more challenging or the more painful the experience becomes. Wow. And this is what most people refer to as kind of a bad trip. Right. But, you know, what shamans refer to that as is a challenging trip because sure. we're, we're forced to confront these challenging aspects of our nature. And the challenge is to surrender. The yes. challenge is to let go, to breathe into the experience, to yes. let it happen. Yes. And when we do that, we find that really there's nothing to be afraid of, mm -hmm. that the experience uh, comes and goes. And yeah. then it's replaced by something, oftentimes a lot more pleasant, sometimes insight, things yeah. along those lines. Something else. But then you have this experience by being able to let go in these highly challenging situations, and then suddenly you realize that's possible. And yes. I can do that with everything. I can yeah. do that with anxiety. I can do that with doubt and insecurity. Like motivational and moment, you know, moment, momentous building, momentum building and things like that. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, just knowing that you have this option to be able to let go and not have to control something, yeah. just let it play out, actually grants you control. Hence the paradox yes. we were discussing before. Absolutely. And I and I want to and I want to thank you for, again for for bringing that to the head because I think a lot of people just want to avoid that. Yeah. Honestly, like. Why? Why do this when I feel this way or I'm, you know, in that regard? So um, what, one thing that I think we need to really touch on is, is this concept and thought of, of sleep paralysis. All right. And this is, this is Tommy's stick right here. I mean, this guy knows this stuff at like the back of his hand. He's worked with clients, what, for four years? Struggling? Seven years. Yeah. Seven years. Uh, seven years. Wow. Struggling with this. And uh, if you could give our, fr our fans and fa fr fan friends and family <laughs> out there woo, uh, an idea of what that is. Because I, I feel like I hear that. I didn't know about sleep paralysis until we started hanging out. Absolutely. I have no idea what it is. So as I alluded to before, there's a wide variety of these altered states yes. of consciousness. Some are accessible through plant medicine, you know, psychedelics. Some are accessible just through um, just these normal things that happen to us in everyday wakeful states. Like I said, driving too mm -hmm. long or, right. you know, uh, empathizing during a movie. Um, things along these lines are just uh, dissociative states, I guess, aren't super normal. But they're accessible without drugs. Right. So this is one of these states that's accessible without drugs. Although for a lot of people, it's not super desirable. Yeah. So there's this natural condition that happens. It happens to everybody actually twice a day, but you probably just don't remember hmm. it. So it happens right as we're falling asleep and right as we're waking up. There's this transition from sleep to wakeful consciousness. And there's a uh, part of the brain called the reticulating activating system that moderates this. It's almost like a light switch for sleep and wakeful consciousness. Okay. When the light switch is flipped off, then we're asleep. When the light switch is flipped on, we're awake, mm -hmm. right? So in these, in these odd states of consciousness, we call them hypnopompic and hypnagogic states of consciousness. It's a transitionatory sleep state where we're half awake, half
half asleep. And in this sleep state, we experience some measure of paralysis because the part of our brain that's falling asleep releases the same chemicals that keep us asleep when we're dreaming. And this is really important. Like when we're dreaming, we don't want to be acting out our dreams. Right. Like if you're having a dream of fighting somebody, we don't want to like be fighting our partner as we're sleeping in bed. Sorry, my mind is just blown by this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you don't think about this until somebody who's a, you know, professional in the field brings it to the... To the to the state and to the plate. I mean, seriously, thumbs up, smiley face, kiss, whatever you got to do out there. <laughs> who who has experienced this? I have. I mean, I don't even know what I'm experiencing until Tommy's told me about it. So if you relate to that, seriously, that's why we're here. Yeah. So one of the important reasons I like talking about sleep paralysis yeah. is it's more commonly experienced than you might understand. So the the statistics say that here in America. Uh, 20 to 30% of Americans will experience sleep paralysis at one point in their life. That might just be one episode or that might be recurring episodes mm -hmm. that happen nightly. In other parts of the country, the stats are a lot higher. Like in Japan, it's roughly around 40% of Japanese people will experience sleep paralysis at one Insane. point in their life. But despite it being relatively common for people to experience, it's one of these things that's not talked about mm -hmm. a lot. You rarely hear psychologists even mentioning sleep paralysis. And when you experience sleep paralysis, you think you're going crazy. Um, you think that, you know, you might be losing your mind. And since there's such a heavy stigma associated with mental illness, people don't want to talk about it. They right. hide it. They keep it to themselves. They don't even tell family members that they're so afraid of the stigma. And so people just kind of keep it to themselves thinking they're going crazy, but it's an incredibly common experience. So it's important to talk about it, to destigmatize it a Absolutely. little bit. That's why we're here. Right. Exactly right. So um, I guess the condition in a nutshell, I mentioned this hypnagogic and hypnopompic state of mind, a transitionatory sleep state. So we're, we're falling asleep or, or right as we're waking up, the chemicals are still present, which keep us paralyzed. And also, according to the medical perspective, we still have the chemicals that are released in the visual occipital lobe that are responsible mm. for dream hallucinations. So all the hallucinations that we experience while we're dreaming. Wow. So we're, we're paralyzed and we're still hallucinating a little bit. Holy shit. But our mind's awake. Our minds have become conscious. We can look around in our room. We can see and experience things. But again, our, we're paralyzed and we're hallucinating. So in, uh, before we get into sleep paralysis, in the basic hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations, you can experience these really bizarre stuff. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this. You can experiment tonight if you want to. All you got to do is you're falling asleep. Try to stay awake or hold on to the feeling of staying awake, but let your body fall asleep. That's a hard thing to do, and it's hard to find the line on. A lot of people don't remember these things. Yes, I have no idea. But you might have, you, this might ring some bells. So sure. a lot of people, when they're falling asleep, they'll have these little flashes, little yes. hallucinations. Like you might hear some some odd, random voice say something completely non sequitur. You know, sure. like the fridge door is open. You know, mm -hmm. and like a random old woman's voice or something <laughs> like that. And you're like, what were well, I've that experienced that in my own home, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to be sleeping for that. Other times you'll experience these flashes of, you know, one of the things that commonly happens to me is feeling like a car is about to hit me. Like I feel mm -hmm. like, um, like I'm about to fall or something along these lines. I get these little hallucinations that will randomly occur. Or sometimes it feels like almost like there's a radio on in the other room. Mm -hmm. You can hear murmuring, but you can't quite make out exactly what's being said. So these are everyday hallucinations that we experience just all the time. Now, sleep paralysis is an extension of this phenomenon. Got it. The hypnagogia and hypnopompa happen to everybody. We all experience it very normal. Sleep paralysis is a bit of, of a dysfunction. That part of the brain yeah. I, I mentioned before, the reticulating activating system, it's a dysfunction in the reticulating activating system. And essentially, that light switch I was talking about, it's almost like it's stuck in the middle. And just like if you were to take a light switch and forcibly stick it in the middle, you might get that flickering of the right. lights that happens. And this is kind of what happens in the mind. Our minds flicker between this wakeful and sleeping consciousness. So we're Damn. partially asleep, so we're hallucinating, and we're having these, um, you know, but we're also partially awake, so we can consciously experience everything that's going on. Now, from the wow. medical perspective, it's said that um, essentially what happens here is the body registers that we're paralyzed. So, right. you know, we're, it's hard to breathe because mm -hmm. even the lungs are paralyzed. Right, right, right. And we tend to be like forcibly staying still because we're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Now the body's trying to figure out why am I paralyzed and we're hallucinating. So from the medical perspective, it said the hallucinations try to make sense out of why we're feeling paralyzed. Mm. So for instance, a lot of the times when people have sleep paralysis, 
First off, not everybody does hallucinate. Um, the minority of individuals who experience sleep paralysis will never hallucinate during mm. their hallucinations, or I'm sorry, during their episodes. All Got the whole it. experience is the mm-hmm. feeling of paralysis. Got it. Now, for um, the majority of individuals, however, they also experience either visual, auditory, or tactile, feeling-based hallucinations. <laughs> now, this takes a lot of different forms. Sure. The most common form is the image of a shadow individual. So, like, um, imagine if you were to shine a bright light against somebody and cast a shadow against the mm-hmm. wall. You get that silhouette form of a human being. Now, imagine that silhouette form of a human being, except not two-dimensional against the wall, but three-dimensional standing right in front of you or maybe even leaning over the bed like looking down at you while you're... <laughs> oh my God, that sounds asleep. scary. <laughs> so as you can imagine, a lot of people Holy really freak shit. out. Yes. Experiences. They're terrifying. And some people even believe, you know, that they're getting haunted by demons yeah. or, you know, that spiritual beings are inter- uh, interacting with them on some level. Uh, I'm not necessarily one to disagree, but I kind of... Uh, I, Personally, I bridge a divide between the scientific perspective and the spiritual perspective, and I like to kind of talk about each individually. Sure. But from the medical perspective, just from the scientific perspective, the body essentially recognizes that it's paralyzed, and the hallucinations are, uh, again, from the medical perspective, said to be filling in the reason why we're paralyzed. So one Got of the it. most common hallucinations is if somebody's um, it feels like somebody's sitting on our chest or pressing down on our chest. Mm-hmm. And again, from the medical perspective, this is because we're paralyzed, we're not breathing. Right. The brain, brain registers that we're not breathing and creates a hallucination to explain why we're not breathing. Ah. Like a demon sitting on our chest or somebody's pressing into That's us. all coming together now, man. Like that makes total sense. Things. Absolutely. So from a medical perspective, you know, that seems to be a valid perspective. Mm-hmm. One of the things that interests me about sleep paralysis is that, you know, there's this unique um, interplay between subjectivity and objectivity. So, Mm -hmm. for instance, if you take the average individual who has sleep paralysis in America and compare these individuals, they'll have somewhat similar themes in what they experience during sleep paralysis. So some might see the shadow figure of a human being. Some might see the shadow figure of a dog or shadow figure. Just, it's always a shadow is what you're saying there. Not right? always. Oh, That's okay, the okay. thing. So not always. Okay. Um, but we most commonly here in the States, we most commonly experience either the shadow figure or the alien abduction syndrome. Got it. Right? So okay. feeling like we're being abducted by aliens, taken into a craft. Yes, and yes, autopsy, yes, 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 You know, yes, yes. getting surgically um, um, manipulated, manipulated of some sort. Right, yes. thank you. Yeah. But here's the weird thing. In other cultures, the hallucination varies. So for instance... That's insane. Go on. <laughs> I'm so intrigued. Okay. So, so for instance, in Japan, where yes. the experience is probably most widely... We experience the phenomena of this little girl with long black hair oh that drapes in front of her face. Oh this is actually where the movie... Um, the Ring. The Ring, right, yeah. Ring. Ah! So, so The Ring is a, uh, it's an American adaptation of the Japanese movie Ringu. Oh, my and God. And Ringu is about this phenomenon. Come on! <laughs> so um, some of the other phenomena that people experience is, you know, um, oftentimes this takes a, a sexual nature. This is yeah. where the old school ideas of the succubus or the incubus came mm. from. You know, these spiritual visitors who spirit... Uh, uh, who visit us in the middle of the night and initiate sexual activity right. with us. So a lot of times people will experience this um, in sleep paralysis. They'll experience the, the hallucination um, acting out some sort of sexual scene in the middle of the night. Jesus Oddly Christ. enough, the vast majority of these experiences are pleasant, not okay. unpleasant, you know, but right. um, let's see. So, so yeah, this interplay between objectivity and subjectivity. The weird thing is though, it's not completely cultural independent. So I work with a lot of individuals who experience sleep paralysis, and while the most of the people I experience, uh, or I'm sorry, I work with experience <laughs> the, um, the the shadow figure, I've had some people who are Americans who experience the little girl with the long black hair, and there's also some other <sighs> common characters that are, are portrayed. So one of the common characters is what we call the the hag, or the old hag. Okay. And the old hag is this old haggard woman who looks like, um, you know, that she's 150 years old. Mm-hmm. She's got wiry gray hair, and she's typically sitting on something. Thing, like sitting on maybe a chest of cabinets or maybe hanging outside your window or something along those lines. Okay. Um, there's also what's referred to as the emaciated man. And the emaciated man is this really skinny, gaunt, uh, human looking creature, not shadow again, okay. um, that crawls around on all fours. <sighs> Um, there's also, um, one of my clients described seeing what he called the gremlin, um, which kind of looks like this. I, yeah, I can't describe it better. Gremlins than from the movie. Gremlin, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, from okay. the movie gremlins look sure. like a little gremlin creature. Um, so, you know, 
it's interesting because if you look at just pure psychosis, which is a mental health condition where people commonly hallucinate, right. sometimes there'll be these common themes within the hallucinations. So for instance, you know, religious persecution mm -hmm. or ideas of grandeur or, yes. or you know, feeling like um, the radio or TV is sending you special signals. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be these, these, these subtle um, common threads within the hallucinations that people with psychosis go through. However, in terms of full on hallucinations, visual hallucinations, they tend to be wildly, wildly different different and subjective to that individual's psyche. Mm. So for instance, one of the case studies I was reading, um, you know, had, uh, it was, uh, so this is a case study from a guy, Wilson Van Dusen, who's a psychologist who's working out of Canada, if I remember correctly. He's studying um, the unique difference between uh, hallucinations that occur in psychosis versus what he refers to as more like spiritually associated hallucinations or oh, wow. hallucinations that might occur in one of these altered states Got or it. in a transpersonal state of mind. Totally. So um, he's describing this difference and he says that, you know, um, for instance, he gives this case study where, where this individual uh, had a hallucination because he was schizophrenic, mm -hmm. hallucination that he had breasts. One of his breasts was full. The other was like shriveled up and dry. And through doing some therapy, it turned out that this hallucination was a, um, a visual representation of, of some drama that was playing out in his un unconscious mind. Okay. So he was raised um, by his mother, who was a very... Um, emotionally withholding woman who okay. kind of had this uh, this haggard kind of element to her and so again the the shriveled breast represented his idea of being raised by his mom Got it. versus like what he wanted which was this you know uh, more emotionally enriching fulfilling uh, relationship yeah, to his mom totally. growing up so in this example we see somebody who's going through psychosis right and the quality of their hallucination is an active reflection of their individual psyche what's going on within them yes that's not so true with sleep paralysis got it with sleep paralysis they tend to have these objective feelings. You know, Joe and Bob might have remarkably similar hallucinations um, if they both experience sleep paralysis, whereas, you know, Joe and Bob, if they were both schizophrenic, might have very wildly yeah, different Yeah, right, right, because their psyche is what you're saying. Right, yeah. Or where, they are, where they are in their life. Right, right. exactly. What they've gone through, how right. they are raised, their totally. perspective, culture, yeah, yeah, the whole nine it. yards. So, you know, I wish it was easy as to say that everybody who experienced sleep paralysis experiences the same thing, but this. That's not the, it's right. easy to say either. Culture is somewhat vary, but there's so much overlap that it, it seems to be somewhat different than just a psychotic hallucination to yes. me. And that's why this experience is so fascinating to me because it raises these questions of, is this just hallucinations? Is this just like psychosis right, right, right. going on? Or, you know, as my clients believe, you know, is something else going on? Like, are totally. they being contacted by spiritual beings right, or, right. you know, these sort of things? A lot that comes up. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's not my position really even to judge for mm -hmm. truth, what is or what isn't going on. As right. a therapist, it's my job to help my clients understand what they're going through totally. and cope with what they're going through, which largely means empathizing with what they're going 100%. through. So I'm not going to tell anybody, you know, what they're going through is purely medical or purely spiritual. I'm mm -hmm. going to relate to my clients where they're at. So if Absolutely. they think they're getting haunted by demons, you know, we're going to work talk on that. About that. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Let's talk about them demons. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a terrifying experience that a lot of people undergo. Sometimes it just happens one night and sure. you experience these hallucinations just for one night and it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, however, for um, this is tends to be a minority of individuals, they experience um, recurring episodes of wow. sleep paralysis that can happen even multiple times per night. But a lot Jeez. of times people experience this on a nightly basis and they get terrified to the point where they can't fall asleep at night. Right. It ruins their lives completely. You know, mm -hmm. they end up shutting themselves in again, Damn. thinking they're crazy. So they don't talk right, to anybody right, about right. it. And they're just left feeling like there's no help. And nobody understands it because nobody's yeah. talking about it. So this is why we're talking about it. Right? <laughs> that is why we're here, people. <laughs> Tommy, oh my God, man, this has been such an amazing breath and depth of information and and I could listen to you talk all goddamn day, dude. Like, I'm just so intrigued by what you bring to the table and your specialty. And, and honestly, we and just scratched the surface. Yeah, too. literally. <laughs> so we'll have to do this again. We're going to do thumbs up. I want to do this again. Throw it out there. Seriously, I this guy can talk for days and it's amazing. Um, before we wrap up, Please, Tommy, if you have any resources for people out there or a place they can reach you, website, phone number, email, whatever, yeah. please plug yourself and let us know where we can get you. Sure. So I guess the best way to reach me would be um, through my website. Mm -hmm. So my website is solacepsych.com. 
S-O-L-A-C-E-P-S-Y-C-H.com. Perfect. Um, so my, my business is Saul's Psychological Services, so it's just solacepsych.com. Mm-hmm. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, you can also shoot me an email at solacepsych at gmail.com if Wonderful. you want to get a hold of me. Again, my name is Tommy Miller. Feel free to reach out. Um, but if you're looking for additional information, there are a few books um, that I'd recommend, particularly on sleep paralysis. And then Netflix uh, documentary too. Yeah, yeah. so there was a, a Netflix documentary released recently um, over the past couple years or so. It's called Nightmare. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do a great job in explaining uh, the biological principles of sleep paralysis or the, the underlying dynamics, but it does a really good job of showing you what the average individual yes. experiences. Totally. And it just kind of takes it just from that, like, what's mm-hmm. the direct experience standpoint. Right. If you're looking to understand it from a clinical perspective a little bit better, there's a book entitled Sleep Paralysis. Uh, That's just the name of it. I can go find that book if you want me to. (laughs) You're good. Uh, We can put it in the link below. (laughs) Yeah, we'll put it in the link below. Um, But it's written by a couple of clinical psychologists who've taken a lot of time to study it. It came out, I think, uh, two or three years ago. Sure. Um, it's got a lot of really great clinical information. If you're looking for more of the spiritual side of things, I recommend Mm -hmm. a book called... um, Dark Intrusions by Lewis Proud. Again, it's not written by a psychologist. It's written by a paranormal investigator. But Very he cool. tries to take on um, a lot of different, the, the history of looking at people who've tried to communicate with spirits mm-hmm. and um, the, the historical perspective of what different cultures have understood about this experience. Very cool. Because this experience has been going on since the dawn of human history, mm-hmm. and every single culture has spoken about it, but we right. all give different languages to how we describe it and what we think is going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me. This, as you can tell, this is a huge passion area of mine, something I've dedicated oh, yeah. my life to study. And so if there's anybody out there who's experiencing sleep paralysis and would like to talk more about it, please reach out. Hit this guy up, people. I do offer a free consultation as well. So. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks for everybody who tuned in today. Super, super privileged to have time to be here and talk to us about this this topic that seriously isn't really being talked about enough. So just another day we're helping destigmatize mental health. Uh, here at Connected Roots, Elliot Andre. See you all later. Hey, thanks a lot, Elliot. Take yeah, care. no problem, bro. <laughs> <it, man. laughs> all right. All right.